Also for a, there we go, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, please make sure to uh, add anything else you, you might want to know from our presenters in that chat as well, and hopefully they'll be able to answer it at the end. Our run for today will be a brief uh, presentation from Hamish, followed by an interview between Mary and Hamish, and then time for questions as we wrap up. So lastly in there, the, we do have a number of RGSQ events coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, you Please check the meeting chat for a few brief details over the next month of our next uh, Geography in Conversation series, our monthly lecture, and the next Geography Matters in a month's time. With that, we will kick into some introductions of our presenters and keep this thing rolling. So we're joined tonight by uh, Hamish McGowan, who is Professor of Atmospheric and Climate Sciences in the School of the Environment at the University of Queensland. He completed his degree as a geographer at the University of Canterbury Christchurch in New Zealand and joined University of Queensland in 2001. His research focuses on earth surface, atmosphere interactions and the application of novel and new technologies to develop understanding of weather and climate. Uh, he has led numerous research projects in Australia, Israel, New Zealand, and the Antarctic, including research of the impact of atmospheric rivers on the Australian snowpack. He's published more than 130 articles in scientific journals and 200 conference presentations. Our interviewer for tonight is Miss Mary Voice. Mary's career has focused on climatology, climate services, and international cooperation via the World Meteorological Organization. In the 1990s, Mary headed a team in the National Climate Centre responsible for monitoring Australian climate and for providing climate analyses, national seasonal climate outlooks, etc. She's run her own consulting business in climate and climate education and has been involved in developing and delivering climate related subjects at universities and been a member for over 10 years of the Board of Advisors for the Climate Alliance, a not for profit that helps business executives understand the risks and opportunities of climate change. A fantastic group uh, joining us tonight. I hope you're as excited to hear from them as I am. With that, I'll throw to Hamish and his presentation. Okay, thank you, John. And um, it's a pleasure to be here speaking to uh, fellow geographers or those who have geographical interests and geographical backgrounds. Um, as you can tell, I'm a Kiwi and as Mary reminded me, I haven't lost the accent. Um, so we'll work through this presentation. Maybe if we leave any questions that you might have until the end, um, then we can sort of work our way through those. Um, I'm actually just getting over a nasty cold, so if I have to stop and clear my throat, please excuse me. Um, I'll also probably require a drink of the non-alcoholic type, of course, um, to aid in that process. So what I want to do this evening is sort of take you on a journey through um, atmospheric rivers. We hear about them in the media, um, there's something that, you know, supposedly didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago. Um, where have they come from? Have they always been there? Where do they impact? And what is the chances of atmospheric rivers impacting us here in Australia? Where do they impact us, for instance? And what's the likely impact of climate change, anthropogenic global warming on atmospheric rivers? And what might it mean for us, uh, not just here in Australia, but globally, over the coming years. So what I'm going to do here is share my screen and we will start the PowerPoint presentation. I hope you can all see that now. So atmospheric rivers, this is a, a conceptual or a nice markup of one by an artist showing this river in the sky of moisture. So the way I'm going to step through this over the next 20 minutes is explore the definitions of atmospheric rivers. I've tried to keep this as, as, as general as possible. I'll discuss how we actually go about measuring and quantifying atmospheric rivers. We'll look at their geographic distribution across the globe, some of the impacts they have, and they're not always negative. Atmospheric rivers can actually have very positive impacts too, up to a certain extent. Then we'll look at or explore atmospheric rivers in the Australian region and some of the impacts that they have here. And as I mentioned, finally, we'll wrap up with a, a brief comment or two on the impact of global warming on atmospheric rivers. So what is an atmospheric river? Well, I think the name um, conveys it very nicely what they are. They are long, narrow, transient corridors in our atmosphere 
of horizontal water vapor transport. So these are, as you'd imagine, long filaments of moisture rich um, areas in our atmosphere. They're associated with jet streams um, or low level jets and they typically occur ahead of our cold fronts. And of course, they're attached to extratropical cyclones. Those features on weather maps, which we identify with an L typically in their center, being centers of low pressure. The water vapor for atmospheric rivers is primarily supplied from tropical and or extratropical sources, namely the oceans, evaporation from the oceans into the atmosphere. Now, how do we define the spatial extent of an atmospheric river, this long filament of moisture rich air at, at some elevation in our atmosphere? Well, the general consensus um, in the scientific community, starting back in the late 1990s, when scientists first started to identify and investigate these uh, filaments of moisture rich air in our atmosphere, they defined atmospheric rivers as having lateral boundaries in the atmosphere with integrated water vapor transport contents of 250 kilograms per meter per second. So they quantify the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere from the surface up to around 300 hectopascals or 9,000 meters above the atmosphere. And where that amount of water vapor begins to exceed 250 kilograms per meter per second, that is the lateral boundary of the atmospheric river. Now, just some simple statistics here, atmospheric rivers on average are about 800 kilometers wide. So these are very large conveyors of moisture in atmosphere, around sort of three kilometers deep. And here's the real kicker, the amount of water or atmospheric moisture that moves in these rivers. On average, it is 500 million kilograms per second. Now, to put that into context, that's roughly about two times the flow in the Amazon River. In terms of the average length, something around 2,000 kilometers. So these are large areas of moisture rich atmospheric filaments of air which are transporting moisture from the tropics and subtropics into the mid latitudes. Now we can classify atmospheric rivers, something akin to what you might be familiar with in terms of classification for tropical cyclones, where we have a scale from one to five. A similar scale has been developed for atmospheric rivers, where we classify them also on a scale from one to five. And the diagram here, which you can see I'm highlighting with my arrow, highlights how we do that. We consider the maximum integrated water vapor transport magnitude of the system from 200 up to 1250, but also the time that there is an atmospheric river prevailing in our atmosphere. So persistence in hours. Now you can see here that once we get above 250 kilograms of um, water vapor in our atmosphere, per meter per second being transported along an atmospheric river, and that persists for more than 24 hours, that is classified as a weak atmospheric river. So it would have a classification of one. Right through to the extreme events, classified as being exceptional atmospheric rivers of category five. These are the events that cause the most dramatic impact through flooding, triggering landslides, leading to um, loss of infrastructure links and the like. Quite often we've seen these in areas, particularly along the Northwest of the US, but Australia is not immune. Australia, as I'll show you, is impacted by moderate to strong atmospheric rivers. Now, where do atmospheric rivers persist in our atmospheric environment above the Earth's surface? Well, if we look at the geographic distribution in the top right of the slide, we see the areas highlighted in the darker shades of red as being those areas where atmospheric rivers are most prevalent. In A, it's through the austral summer, so from November through to March. We can see to the south of Australia here, we have in the westerlies, 
this broad area where atmospheric rivers are most common. To our north, we have some around the tropics and then up into the northern hemisphere. Also out in the Atlantic, with water being trans vapor being transported um, from the east coast of the US across the North Atlantic into Europe. And also in the southern Atlantic, down into the roaring 40s. As we move into the austral coolest months, into our winter, we see a change in that geographic distribution with atmospheric rivers being very prominent in the Northwest Pacific, out into the Eastern South Pacific, and the zone of activity in the Atlantic becomes more pronounced as well. In terms of impact, the frequency of days per year that atmospheric rivers make landfall. This diagram shows that on my left here. This is for all months from 1997 to 2014. And we can see here that the large circles represent locations where atmospheric rivers make landfall more than 16 days a year. And we see Southwest Australia as being one of those regions down around Southern Victoria, South Australia, New Zealand gets absolutely hammered. And also down the coasts around our oceanic basin here in the Pacific and the North Atlantic. Unsurprisingly, this is where we have our frontal systems, our cold fronts moving through these regions, transporting water vapor sourced from the tropics into the mid and higher latitudes. So that's the geographic distribution of atmospheric rivers. You notice also on this that they don't affect inland regions. It's primarily the coastal zones that are most impacted by atmospheric rivers. Now here's a really nice schematic of an atmospheric river, very simple. It's from the Scripps Oceanographic Institute in the US, which shows a model of an atmospheric river moving in from the North Pacific onto the south, southern British Columbia coast and then moving further inland over the coastal range into the Rockies. <coughs> Excuse me. And as I mentioned, these conveyors are transporting immense volumes of water. The average atmospheric river carries something around twice the volume of the Amazon or 25 times the volume of the Mississippi. Note these examples reflect the source of the diagram. Now, as this water moves through our atmosphere and it encounters topography or mountain ranges, the atmosphere or the air that is carrying that water vapor is forced to ascend up over the topographic barrier. And in doing so, that air cools, the water vapor condenses, produces cloud, and then typically significant precipitation. And you can see that once you go over the coastal range here in this example, and the air descends on the lead, the precipitation is not as significant until you encounter the Rockies further inland where precipitation again occurs. The greatest impact is typically along the coastal ranges on our west coast orientated coastlines that are greatly impacted. The impact of atmospheric rivers on these environments is dependent on the intensity of the system. So how much water vapor is being transported and the persistence. How long do these conveyors of atmospheric water impact a particular location? Naturally, of course, that affects the volume of water that is precipitated out on these regions. Not always are they delivering an adverse effect. Typically, atmospheric rivers often lead to a recharge reservoirs with water. They may um, break droughts. And a, a good example of that is what's happened in the uh, Californian, Northern Californian area up into Oregon and Portland last summer, Northern Hemisphere winter, when there was around 32 atmospheric rivers that broke the drought that had persisted in Northern California for about the last 15 to 20 years. Um, <laughs> the rainfall was so significant it actually led to, to flooding in areas that hadn't flooded for decades. And it also resulted in snowfalls on the Sierra Nevadas of an excess of 60 feet. So they can have 
positive beneficial impacts as well as adverse impacts if they occur too often or the intensity of the storm is prolonged, leading to flooding, mudslides and the like. Atmospheric rivers are associated with something like 40 to 75% of extreme wind events. And that's probably something that a lot of you weren't aware of. Not only do atmospheric rivers bring a lot of rain to these regions, but they also often bring extreme wind. And they are responsible for somewhere around 40% of the extreme wind and precipitation events along the world's coastlines. In terms of the annual financial impact of atmospheric rivers, we have an estimate around $10 billion US annually. This diagram here, this animation, shows atmospheric rivers, these filaments of moisture rich air moving out of the mid latitudes and the subtropics, in, sorry, moving out of the subtropics into the mid latitudes and impacting the west coast of North America. Okay, so these green filaments of air, these are our atmospheric rivers. I'll run, just go back to that and run it again. I think the nice thing about these sort of animations, it shows you how dynamic the atmosphere is and the transport of that moisture rich air in onto the topography of California, Oregon, up into Washington State and into British Columbia. Now, getting closer to home here in Australia, what is the impact of atmospheric rivers here? How often do they do we get them or impacted by them? Where do they occur? And what is the nature of their occurrence through the year? Well, there's three key areas that are impacted most in Australia by atmospheric rivers. One is to our northwest, shown in diagram A here, with the blue box indicating where the highest frequency of atmospheric rivers occurs. The moisture here in the atmosphere is sourced from the warm ocean waters to our northwest in the eastern Indian Ocean up into the maritime continent region. The second area of action in terms of atmospheric rivers in that area is along our east coast. Most of the transport here is not onto our coast, but typically south in onto the New Zealand coastline and New Zealand Alpine area. And the third region of activity is to our south, unsurprisingly. Down here where we have our frequent passage of mid-latitude depressions and associated frontal systems transporting water vapor south into the mid-latitudes from the subtropics. In terms of the variability in those regions, the Northwest, the Pacific East Coast here, the East Coast of Australia and the Southern Ocean, the change through the seasons in those areas is indicated by the diagrams below. So in the Northwest, unsurprisingly, the majority of atmospheric rivers occur in our summer period, associated with monsoonal activity in this region, decreasing markedly through into the late dry season, September, October, November. In the Pacific, once again, it's a summer dominated regime here where we have the most frequent occurrence of atmospheric rivers. And then sort of through our autumn and winter period, it doesn't change that much and it falls away in the spring as we become more under the influence of um, the subtropical ridge. As we move to the south, uh, the most frequent occurrence of atmospheric rivers in this region is in our autumn. And look at the magnitude compared to the tropics. 2000 compared to 400, okay through this period here from 1980 to 2019. Are we seeing more atmospheric rivers in our region? Is there any sort of temporal trend? Well, here's some work from uh, Kimberly Reed. Her research identified that yes, in the Australian region, we're seeing an upward trend in the occurrence of atmospheric rivers, but it's very gradual. The trend is very gradual, only one per year, but nonetheless, there is an upward trend. I looked at this diagram myself and I saw these spikes 
And I, I sort of wondered whether or not they may be associated with El Nino years um, because that does tend to uh, lead to uh, more vigorous westerly flow across the continent and therefore uh, an increased prevalence of frontal systems like this one here where we have the atmospheric river highlighted in the blue as moisture is transported from the tropical region to the north of the Kimberley down through the center of the continent ahead of this cold front towards southeast Australia. Some of you might also be familiar with these cloud bands being referred to as northwest cloud bands. The impact of this on our precipitation regime or our rainfall regime across the continent is that southeast Australia is really dependent on atmospheric rivers like this to deliver substantial volumes of rainfall to this region. Here's some other work that we undertook, looking at the role of atmospheric rivers impacting the alpine environment of Southeast Australia. We were able to identify them using the criteria I outlined before, where the edges of the atmospheric river are defined with a boundary of 250 kilograms per meter per second of integrated water vapor transport through to the core of the system which can, carries considerably more. So this is an atmospheric river moving down from the tropics up over Timor and Indonesia, down through the Kimberley to the southeast of Australia and Tasmania. This is the synoptic weather map associated with that. So it's moving ahead of these trough lines down through this region where my arrow is. And this diagram here shows the um, the wind motion in terms of the vector component flow. So what we have here is a transport down through this region of purple here to the south. Okay, so this is southerly flow. Here's another example here of a northwest cloud band moving across Western Australia into Southeast Australia. And of course, it's transporting moisture. Here's our integrated water vapor measurement or calculation. And we see that it has a core here, somewhere around about 900 kilograms per meter squared per second, which is an immense volume of water. And what was the, why we were studying this was to look at the impact that these conveyors of warm, humid tropical air the impact that they have on our snowpack. Australian snowpack is classified as marginal. It's a new definition that we've submitted for publication because the, the snowpack is isothermal. That means it has a temperature which is effectively zero from the base of the snowpack to the surface of the snowpack. And therefore very subtle additions of energy such as in the form of warm rain on the snowpack can lead to very rapid melt of the snow and effectively loss of the snowpack. So during this event, we were undertaking some other research in the Snowy Mountains near Perisher, where we were measuring not just precipitation and characteristics of the snowpack, but also the exchanges of energy over the snowpack. Latent heat associated with change in the phase of water and also sensible heat flux, as well as heat flux associated with rainfall. So on this diagram here, I have the energy flux, which we measure with units of watts per meter squared. And it goes from zero to 200 and from zero to negative 100. And this is measurements made over the surface of the snow on this particular period from the 21st to the 3rd of July, 2016 at Perisher. And what we have here as the atmospheric river approached us was an increase in sensible heat flux. So the air got warmer and that transferred heat into the snowpack. We also had a lot of energy come from the form of rain to the snowpack and that drove melt. And the corresponding effect on the Perisher River, or the Snowy River in this case actually, sorry, was that discharge in the middle of winter went from about 10 cubic meters per second 
up to over 300 cubic meters per second. And that happened in a period of about 12 hours in the middle of winter. And that was the result of very rapid melt as the atmospheric river transported warm, humid, moist, warm, humid air with a lot of warm moisture in it down over the Alpine region where it precipitated out and contributed a significant amount of energy to the snowpack and led to rapid melt. The impact of that was what you see here in the opening slide that I think Mary might have put up, and that was effectively the demise of the ski season on this particular occasion for a few days, as all the snow effectively was washed off the slopes. Now, what's gonna happen with atmospheric rivers as we move forward into the later part of the century? We all know that the weather has been somewhat crazy over the last 12 months um, with extremes of precipitation everywhere. The most recent, of course, was the horrific flooding in Libya, which occurred in the last 24 hours. What is the impact of this warming on atmospheric rivers? Well, it's going to be considerable. Everything on this diagram, which is pink on the map here on the background, are regions where we're going to see an increase in the frequency of atmospheric rivers. And these are in areas which are already heavily impacted by atmospheric rivers making landfall. Up in this area here in East Asia, we will see an increase in the frequency of atmospheric rivers. Those symbols which are highlighted in red indicate a movement of atmospheric river activity and impacts towards the poles. Whereas symbols which are in blue, like over in Southern Africa here, indicate a movement towards the equator in terms of landfall of atmospheric rivers. So overall, we can see that atmospheric rivers are going to extend their reach more into the higher latitudes. Those impacts are going to be an increase in frequency such as in Europe, Greenland, North America. In New Zealand, we're likely to see an increase in snow and ice melt because of an increased occurrence of warm precipitation on the Southern Alps. The same will occur in, of course, the Sierra Nevadas and the Rocky Mountains, although they're somewhat further inland, so less directly impacted. There'll be an increase in precipitation Precipitation extremes will increase. And that's a consequence of the fact that for every degree that the atmosphere warms, its water holding capacity increases by around 7%. Now, the atmosphere over the last century or so, 120 to 130 years, has warmed somewhere around about 1.4 degrees Celsius. So that water holding capacity of the atmosphere has increased by around about 10 to 12% over that period of time. Now that means with more water vapor in the atmosphere being transported by these atmospheric rivers when they encounter land masses and are forced up over topography, for example, then the amount of rain that is going to occur is considerably more than would have happened 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. I read an article a few months ago about the impact of global warming on atmospheric rivers and they also, the authors of that article made the comment that not only do we have to consider the effect of atmospheric warming, increasing the amount of water vapor held in the atmosphere, but when we bring that together with the effect of large mountain ranges on precipitation associated with atmospheric rivers, we can see increases or likely see increases in precipitation in excess of 13 to 15%. Now that is a very substantive increase for which our roads, our drainage networks, our infrastructure is just not designed to handle. So it's gonna present some significant challenges. And one of those challenges, of course, is not necessarily always caused by liquid precipitation. This is a photo from the Sierra Nevadas last winter in the Northern Hemisphere, our summer where they had over 65 feet of snow in some locations associated with 32 atmospheric rivers that made landfall. 
one of my former PhD students works not far from this location here. He runs a snow laboratory for Berkeley University. He was entering and exiting his prop, prop property through the third floor window. He could no longer um, make his way down to the first floor in spite of having dug this immense uh, staircase of snow steps and he'd retreated to just moving in and out of his house through a louver on the third floor. So in summary, atmospheric rivers, just think of them as big filaments of moisture rich air in the atmosphere, which are transporting warm, humid air loaded with moisture from the tropics and subtropics into the mid latitudes. They are large, sort of 800 kilometers wide, maybe 2000 kilometers long. They prevail for a few days to perhaps a week at most. They're reasonably transient. At any one time around our planet, we have four to six atmospheric rivers. The water transport is typically always poleward. The greatest impacts are on our westerly facing coasts, such as the west coast of New Zealand, southwest WA, the west coast of North America, and around the British Isles up into Scandinavia. And the impact is enhanced where we have orographic processes further increasing rainfall as these warm conveyors of air are forced up over substantive mountain ranges. The main hazards associated with atmospheric rivers are rain and extreme snowfall, but also winds. These atmospheric phenomena bring extreme meteorology. Having said that, of course, they also naturally bring benefits, particularly if they impact a region which has been affected by drought for a long period of time, as we've seen in California over the last few months. And finally, what is going to be the impact of global warming on atmospheric rivers? Well, global warming will increase the intensity of atmospheric rivers, namely the amount of precipitation associated with them, and it will also increase the frequency of atmospheric rivers. So I'll leave it there. Um, that's hopefully giving you a, a quick overview of what atmospheric rivers are. And like I said at the outset, just think of them as the name implies, large rivers in our atmosphere that are transporting moisture from the tropics and subtropics to higher latitudes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hamish. That was fantastic. Whoops, I'm just knocking things around here. Uh, yeah, that was that was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, uh, normally, we give you a big handshake at this point, so um, I'll I'll do the clapping for uh, for everybody who's watching in at the moment. So it's now our opportunity to have a bit of uh, a discussion about them. Um, so, uh, John, is it possible to put both of our faces on the screen together, side by side? Is it, can, can you do that or not? There <laughs> yeah. we go. That's good. There you, you go. Yay. <laughs> okay, so let's have a, a, a discussion before we go to the audience for questions. Uh, but if you have any questions Folks, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll deal with them shortly. So, Hamish, my first question is, do they sometimes get names? Yes, yes, probably the most common name that you might, well, man, never even thought of being associated with the atmosphere, an atmospheric river was something known as the Pineapple Express. So the transport of moisture uh, from in the region of Hawaii across the Northeast Pacific in onto the coast of California. Okay, so the Pineapple Express is probably the most widely known um, colloquial name for an atmospheric river. Yeah, and was that one of the first ones identified, do you think? Most of the work was originally done in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Northwest, um, sorry, the Northeast Pacific um, on the Northwest coast of the US. And that's because of the the impact that atmospheric rivers was having there and continues to have and increasingly has. Um, so that's where the real 
focus of research has been globally. And um, undoubtedly, you know, the Pineapple Express was, was one of the triggers for that research. Here in Australia, um, our atmospheric river that probably most people are familiar with is something we refer to as Northwest Cloud Bands. Uh, not, north, not all Northwest Cloud Bands carry in the, the volume of moisture to be classified as atmospheric rivers, but a lot do. Yep, yep. We'll come, we might come back to that in, in a moment. Um, the, on the short term, like 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, three or four days ahead, are the weather models very good at predicting, uh, predicting them and predicting how much rain will come out of them? Uh, the short answer to that is, is yes. I, I couldn't say anything else, could I, Mary? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, at that, that short time frame of, of, you know, 24 to 48 hours, maybe 72 hours, uh, the models are pretty good at, at forecasting uh, the regions which are likely to experience landfall of atmospheric rivers. Um, perhaps the, the more challenging thing is to resolve those areas that are likely to receive the really intense rainfall, um, particularly where you have complex uh, coastal terrain, such as substantive mountain ranges and so forth, um, and you start to get isolated pockets of exceptional rainfall. Those things become somewhat more challenging to forecast with those longer lead times. But um, in general, yes, the models do a very good job of forecasting atmospheric rivers. Yeah, and one of the things that I know is happening as well is that there's the atmospheric model that forecasts the rainfall, but then you need a good topography model with mm. the river basins and the fine detail of the topography in order to tell what that rainfall will do when it gets on the ground. And we're getting better at that as well. Um, there's still a fair way to go in, in that side of things in terms of getting the fine scale, but that's improving as well. Yes, yes, definitely. And, and I think we, you know, in some respects, we saw that here in, in Brisbane, um, uh, not last summer, the summer before, where we had that exceptional rainfall uh, impacting Brisbane over a number of days, you know, the models were, were struggling to resolve at times uh, the volume of precipitation that was going before, you know, two, three, four hundred millimetres in, in 12 to 24 hours. Um, but once again, you know, that's just uh, a product of our lack of ability at present to be able to fully resolve the complex processes that happen in our atmosphere um, and how those processes are affected by, by complex topography uh, underneath them and and you know we're getting better at it and uh, that's why we do research and and study these things to to try and prove our ability to forecast them so we can warn people of, of an approaching heavy rainfall event and the severe winds that it may well bring also okay so now i'd like to share um screen and put up a an image of a northwest cloud band atmospheric river uh, and some complex things over Australia. And maybe we can discuss a few questions associate that I have associated with that. So, there we go. So can you see that Hamish? Yeah. Okay, so we've got something that looks like uh, an atmospheric river uh, northwest cloud band coming in from the Indian Ocean over Australia, which is sitting in the middle of the picture there, rather dirty brown looking. And then we've got an interesting structure over in the Coral Sea as well. Yes. So um, my question, my first question is Queensland. Um, where does most of the moisture come in terms of uh, rivers that affect Queensland. Is it from the ones that come over from the Indian Ocean or is it more the sort that come down from the Coral Sea uh, and down into Bas into the Tasman Sea? Uh, in Queensland, it's principally out of the north, out of the Coral Sea and um, sometimes wrapped around the uh, lows that form off our coast here and comes out of the northern Tasman Sea. Um, yeah. The, the moisture that comes down, these cloud bands from the northwest, which this image beautifully shows, um, tends to be transported at, at mid-levels uh, across the continent and then is precipitated out primarily as that diagram I showed um, in southeast Australia. Yep, yep, 
Yep. So then my next question associated with Queensland is uh, in the summertime, tropical cyclones also form in the Coral Sea and impact the Queensland coast. So has anybody done any assessments of the relative rainfall impact of these uh, bands of moisture that come down through the Coral Sea uh, compared to a, a, a well-formed tropical cyclone? No, I, I haven't seen anything that's uh, no published work that makes the direct comparison between um, precipitation associated with tropical cyclones or ex-tropical cyclones um, and northwest cloud bands, so, sorry, with um, atmospheric rivers. Yeah, um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because you're then talking about um, how you manage the infrastructure down the Queensland coast for, yes. for, uh, for changes in tropical cyclones and or changes in atmospheric rivers. Yeah, I think, I think the main thing here in Queensland, of course, you know, as we move forward through the century and, and the climate continues to warm, that certainly doesn't look like there's any reasonable steps being taken to address that problem at the moment. Um, I think what we need to be conscious of that the, as the atmosphere warms, its water holding capacity increases and that results in the more intense precipitation when we have rainfall events. And I think what we've seen um, over the last two or three months occur around the Mediterranean um, and also in, in California um, and in Nevada, uh, is is a, perhaps a, a, a warning to us of what we can expect. Um, these high magnitude uh, precipitation events um, where we're getting hundreds of millimetres a day, uh, leading to flash flooding and so forth. Whether or not, you know, they're associated with a atmospheric river or a tropical cyclone. Um, so I think we should prepare for more extreme precipitation events all round. Yep. Okay, so now looking at this diagram again, uh, I've got two more questions associated with this diagram. First of all, the um, the band coming in over the Indian Ocean onto the coast. Uh, you pointed out that when they hit the American coast, there's a big mountain range there. So the air goes up over the mountain range, cools and drops out huge amounts of water. Whereas what you were describing before the water can, uh, over over Australia, the water continues to track across until it gets down into southeastern Australia. Yes. Um, so is that mainly because we haven't got a big mountain range on the west coast? Yeah, well, I really don't want to, to offend anyone from Western Australia, <laughs> Mary. Um, <laughs> but but um, yes, by and large, yes. Um, Western Australia does not have any substantial uh, topography um, of any expanse along that western flank of the continent um, in contrast to what we see uh, along the west coast of the US and up into Canada. Yep, yep, yep. And then the final question associated with this, uh, this uh, satellite picture, right down in the far right hand corner there, you can see the faint outline of, of New Zealand. I think this was 5 p.m. Australian time, yes. so it's already night time in New Zealand. That's um, that's why it looks rather rather faint down there in the corner. But there's there's two questions associated with atmospheric rivers associated with that. Does New Zealand quite often get the tail end of the atmospheric rivers that are coming across from the Indian Ocean uh, and across Australia? And how many of those does it get compared to the atmospheric rivers that come down through the um, Coral Sea into the Tasman Sea and slam into New Zealand? I'm sure you know about this, Hamish, because you're a Kiwi. Yeah, the, the, the most significant atmospheric rivers to impact New Zealand have tropical moisture or subtropical moisture sources. So they're coming down from the Coral Sea and Northern Tasman Sea. Um, and they are running typically um, ahead of a, a cold front, naturally, um, which is able to link up with the tropical system to actually convey that moisture into a southeasterly direction and onto the west coast of the South Island, typically, um, but also, you know, the North Island um, as well. 
but the greatest precipitation enhancement occurs along the western slopes of the southern alps yeah yeah a, a, a wonderful place to have moisture eh? you know um, um yeah well it, it, a, a it, nice, it, sea, know. nice sea to the west and then a beautiful range of mountains uh, just almost perpendicular to the wind yeah, I mean, typically what New Zealand will see um, as climate warms is uh, also an increased prevalence of atmospheric rivers impacting uh, the Alpine area. Um, that will result, of course, in, in warm, what we call rain on snow melt events, where we have warm rain uh, enhancing snow melt, and that leads or increases the risk markedly of, of significant flooding because the water that uh, exits a catchment is much more than what is falling uh, at the time by mm. precipitation because it's melting water that's stored in the catchment as snow and ice and that's flowing out as well as that which is forming falling in a liquid state yeah and um impacting your glaciers as well yes yes definitely um so that's that there are things that you know we will see very rapid change i expect over the next few decades Okay, so I think that should conclude our discussion and we should go to question time. So let me uh, stop sharing the screen and let's see what we've got in the chat. So I need to put my glasses on for that. So the first, the first comment, thanks Hamish, that was great. How do you expect the forthcoming El Nino will affect atmospheric rivers in Australia? That comes from Ichil, I think is the name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a really good question. Um, let me start by saying we've been in El Nino for several months. Um, our El Nino is not forthcoming, it's here. Um, it's just the metric that the Bureau uses to define the onset of an El Nino in our part of the world or the impact of an El Nino in our part of the world is why they haven't called it. Um, yet the World Meteorological Organization and, and NOAA, for example, um, in the US, they called the El Nino months ago. In terms of its impact on uh, atmospheric rivers in the Australian region, I haven't seen any anything yet which I'd consider a definitive study of the impact of uh, ENSO or El Nino sudden oscillation on atmospheric rivers. Um, my thoughts are that El Nino is likely to increase the occurrence of atmospheric rivers, particularly in the southern regions um, of the continent and to our south. And that's because we get enhanced westerly flow um, associated with El Nino events. Yeah. Um, and, and that, to some extent, I guess, um, the structure of the um, the structure of the sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean uh, can make a, a difference there. Yes. Uh, if yeah. there's a, a large amount of cold sea surface temperatures compared to normal in the Indian Ocean, then that will push the atmospheric rivers even further south and they might uh, um, skirt, skirt the southern coast of the continent rather than actually um, fall across the continent. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll skip I'll skip one and come back to it and go on to Gavin's question. Uh, yeah, just just to, just I might just come back to your to your comments there, Mary, about the role of the Indian Ocean on atmospheric rivers. Um, usually, we see an increased frequency of atmospheric rivers when we have a negative Indian Ocean dipole. Now, the Indian Ocean dipole, um, so the listeners, is something very similar to the El Nino phenomenon, but it works in the Indian Ocean Basin. And during a negative phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, we have warmer water, warmer than usual to our Northwest. And that means that more water vapor is, or more water is evaporated from those warm sea surface temperatures into the lower atmosphere. And that increases the amount of water vapor, which is then available to be transported to the southeast of the continent where it precipitates out. The opposite of that is a positive Indian Ocean dipole where we actually have cooler waters to the northwest of the continent. And that's the kind of setup which we're experiencing at the moment. 
And that means that because the waters to our northwest are cooler than normal, there is less evaporation from those sea surfaces and less water in our atmosphere or water vapor in the atmosphere for transport to the southeast. So it tends to be drier. So less chance or reduced frequency of atmospheric rivers under those conditions as opposed to a negative Indian Ocean dipole. Yep. Thanks, Hamish. So Gavin has asked a personal question of you, Hamish. Did you grow up on the west coast of New Zealand, South Island, and did that inspire you to research huge volumes of rain? <laughs> or alternatively, <laughs> what inspired your career? <laughs> um, no, I didn't grow up on the west coast. I actually grew up on the east coast um, in the lee of the Southern Alps. Uh, I suppose I, because I grew up on a farm, I was um, always seeing the, the impact of changing weather um, on the landscape and of course on farming operations. Uh, so you became very conscious at a very early age um, of how the weather impacted not just the landscape and the environment, but um, what your parents did and, and how much money they had or they didn't have. And, and I remember as a very small boy sitting on an apple box um, feeding sheep in the long paddock because it was a drought caused by an El Nino um, to the other extreme of, of watching rivers run where you never expected to watch rivers run during extreme rainfall events associated with atmospheric rivers coming in from the northeast, which is quite unusual onto the South Island. So that's where my interests in um, weather and climate uh, probably stems from. Okay, now the term long paddock, is, is it the same in New Zealand as Australia? The term long paddock in Australia is all the stuff along the sides of the road that doesn't get eaten out by the sheep and the cattle. And when a drought comes, the farmers let their sheep and cattle out onto the long paddock because there's no uh, feed left on their actual paddocks. So is it the same uh, in yes. New Zealand? It yes. is. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. So now John Fairbairn, is Southwest WA likely to get wetter over time? I assume that means, you know, under under uh, uh, a global warming scenario. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one, John. I don't have the answer to that. Um, you know, I'm sure you're well aware that, you know, since the early 70s, Southwest WA has been in a drying trend uh, and that has been uh, linked by a number of researchers to... Uh, Two key things. One, of course, is global warming and a, and a change in circulation patterns um, across that region as a consequence of global warming and a movement in rain-bearing weather systems, uh, but also changes in land surface characteristics. Um, so as we move forward into the century and the, the atmosphere warms, um, I can't give you a, a definitive answer as terms what the impact is likely to be on the occurrence of rainfall in that region or um, atmospheric rivers. Yeah, and the and the fronts coming up from the southwest are particularly important for Southwest WA. Yes. So what happens to them is also a, a crucial factor in determining what happens to to the rainfall and how far into southwest wa it gets so yes. yeah it's a, it's a bit of a tricky one yeah if, if you send me an email afterwards i can certainly point you in the right direction to get an answer to that question and finally i think it's finally i don't think there's another one come in rita uh, said how do the rivers start and also how do they end or die out they are associated with the transient evolution of mid-latitude cyclonic systems, they, they form um, along frontal zones where you have convergences of air masses um, and you have to have that, have a front formation, what we call frontogenesis, the formation of a cold front before you get the um, development of an extratropical low pressure system. Once those systems form, then they will track in the prevailing flow, um, which in the mid-latitudes is a westerly, flow and they will move um, from west to east and transport the water vapour with that. Um, low pressure systems eventually uh, infill as the, uh, effectively they rotate and you get a, a mixing of the air masses so you lose what we call 
uh, baroclinic conditions across the frontal zone, and we lose that clearly distinguishable difference in EMS, and the low pressure system infills and decays. So they, <laughs> they form um, with the formation of low pressure systems, those eddies that you might have seen in that animation that I showed, um, and they're transient. They last three or four days. Okay. Uh, I, my final uh, question to you, Hamish, obviously uh, you're USQ, is that correct? I'm at UQ. UQ, sorry, UQ. Uh, so you and colleagues at UQ are, are obviously con continuing to study these. And I know Kimberly Reed from Monash <laughs> University is studying them as well. Um, do you know of anybody else in Australia who's looking into the, these phenomena? Not, not at the present time. There's been some work done uh, at the University of Targa in New Zealand. Quite a, several papers have been published down there over the last two or three years on atmospheric rivers there. But in Australia here, it's really Kimberly who's led the, the research. Um, and, and we've produced a couple of papers um, here looking at the impact on uh, effectively warm rain on snow events associated with atmospheric rivers, but also from a climatological perspective, uh, the relationship around the Australian continent of atmospheric rivers to time of year um, and the relationship to northwest cloud bands as to whether or not northwest cloud bands can be really considered atmospheric rivers. Um, but as the time goes forward, um, no doubt there'll be other researchers that look at them and, and potentially how they change in time uh, as they suffer the consequences of global warming. Thanks very much, Hamish. So, John, I think we are almost exactly on time, which is probably pretty good, is it? <laughs> I think that's very good indeed. And I'd like to thank again both Hamish and Mary for an absolutely fantastic session tonight. I know a hell of a lot more now about atmospheric rivers and also uh, Hamish's childhood. So <laughs> a fantastic session. Thank, thank you again to our presenters and thank you to everyone for joining us online. Check the RGSQ website for upcoming events and we will be releasing this recording on YouTube in the next few days. Thanks everyone and have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.